So allow me to welcome Dr. Walsh. Thanks, Vilma. Uh, everyone, welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us tonight. Um, we will uh, make, make this to the point, and I want to make sure that all questions are answered at the end. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about overactive bladder, and uh, we will work through this together, and we will get started right now. Okay, away we go. Uh, as I said, thanks for, get, for joining us tonight. I am Dr. Richard Walsh. Um, I practice with Colorado Springs Urological Associates here in Colorado Springs and uh, have been specializing in overactive bladder and female uh, pelvic health uh, for the 22 years that I've been in practice. So many people find it hard to come to the urologist to begin with um, and kind of have an embarrassment about some of their overactive bladder issues and how can I manage my lifestyle? What's gonna happen? And as you can see, almost half of the people are very challenged to come to the table to discuss it, but we have many, many different things that we can do to help patients. And this is, goes for both men and for women. It's not just a female issue. Um, what we want to do tonight is talk about kind of what is incontinence, what is overactive bladder, stress incontinence, fecal incontinence, uh, and then give you an idea of what we call our care pathway as far as how we work through from your first appointment all the way on down to more advanced treatment options if necessary. So one in six adults in the United States are bothered by overactive bladder. Uh, as I said, it it's really something that affects both men and women, although women are typically more willing to come to the table and discuss the problem. And it can be very disruptive to your lifestyle. It can make you lose sleep because you're getting up so often at night. It can affect what you're willing to do outside of the household on a daily basis uh, and can really just generate some poor um, self-image issues. So 37 million adults, if you do the math for one in six adults, and if you compare that to other issues, visual problems, um, diabetes, uh, it far uh, outpaces both of those issues. So, so what is normal? Um, typically eight times a day for a bathroom visit to empty the bladder, anything more frequent than that really gets into the disruptive category. Um, and in addition to the frequent urination is the urgency the urge to get there and the inability to get to the bathroom fast enough and having almost no warning signal. Um, people start to change their lifestyles. They tend not to drink water. They tend to be too dehydrated simply because they're trying to avoid um, that bathroom trip as much as possible. And then with the urgency that leads to urge incontinence where you simply cannot get to the bathroom fast enough and have leak issues, um, now people are finding they have to use a pad or a liner, and it may be multiple pads and liners per day, and that can be both days and nights where people will wake up in the middle of the night and find themselves wet before they can even get out of the bed and get to the bathroom. So bladder control works kind of on two levels. Um, there's a local level where as the bladder fills uh, and stretches, as it's filling, there's a local mechanism in the pelvis that says, hey, it's time for you to head to the bathroom, um, as well as sending a signal up the spinal cord and going to the uh, kind of the voiding center in your brain, if you will, that coordinates everything as far as muscle control. And you have to have the proper signal going back to the bladder that tells the bladder when it's time to squeeze to empty. And in coordination with that, you have to have a signal that goes to the sphincter muscle that tells the sphincter muscle to relax, to allow the bladder to empty. So it's a multi-level um, control mechanism. Same thing for the bowels. Um, as the, the fecal material collects uh, in the rectum, um, it sends that signal to coordinate emptying. And it, it's, it's a different muscle, um, but it's the same nerve. And so the signal um, for both urinary control as well as fecal control, when we talk about incontinence, um, can be controlled um, by the same mechanism that we use here for treatment. So what causes your incontinence? Why, why, why does one person who comes through the door have overactive bladder symptoms and the next person who comes through the door doesn't? 
um, it can be triggered um, and initiated with pregnancy and, and childbirth, um, pelvic radiation for certain cancers, uh, pelvic floor injuries and trauma, in addition to having a side effect from certain medications that you take, certain supplements, and certain daily habits as far as your diet. And the classic example would be anything caffeinated because caffeine is one of the most powerful stimulants for the bladder and can cause quite a bit of overactive symptoms. So the three common things that we see in the office is stress incontinence, urinary retention, and overactive bladder, which includes urge incontinence. And we'll talk a little bit about each of these. Stress incontinence is, a, is the coughing, sneezing leakage. Um, if you exercise, jump on a trampoline, lift something heavy. Um, some people find that they even have control issues just when they arise from a chair after being seated for a while, reading a paper or watching TV. Um, and that forces them to be going to the bathroom frequently to try and keep their bladder as empty as possible. Urinary retention can, can really be kind of two different categories. Non-obstructive urinary retention is the inability for the bladder to empty. That's not caused by any sort of blockage. The classic example in men would be an enlarged prostate gland. Um, a classic example in women would be any sort of urethral trauma during childbirth that causes a blockage and doesn't allow the bladder to empty. For this type of urinary retention, it really is an inability of the bladder to coordinate a good squeeze and generate a pressure head in order to empty. And that can ultimately result in the use of a catheter, either having that catheter in all the time or having to catheterize yourself intermittently throughout the day in order to empty the bladder. And then there's overactive bladder. And this category really comprises frequency of urination, urgency of urination to the point of urge incontinence where you can't make it to the bathroom in time, as well as what we call nocturia, which is getting up at night to empty. And some people are getting up hourly at night, which disrupts that deep sleep pattern and results in being fatigued throughout the day. So if you're going to the bathroom more than eight times during the day, or you're getting up two, three, even up to six times at night, you certainly fall into the category of overactive bladder. Fecal incontinence is either the urgency to get to the bathroom to have a bowel movement and being almost unable to get there in time or fecal incontinence where there really is no warning whatsoever and people are having accidents um, where they're having fecal material pass and that can require the use of pads just like urge incontinence with the bladder. What's the good news? We have lots of treatment for overactive bladder and that's where we're gonna to focus tonight. And um, a lot of people, many women uh, through the years have had the, I have to suffer in silence mentality about these diagnoses. And that's simply not true. We've got many, many different things that we can do to try and gain better control over the bladder and, and give patients freedom. So the first step is we have to come up with the proper diagnosis. And, and this is something that can get glossed over in the, the primary care offices because they're so focused on the more pressing issues such as hypertension or high cholesterol, diabetes, things like that. And by the time they get to talking about some of the overactive bladder symptoms, they simply run out of time with their patients. And so the simple starting point is lifestyle changes. And when we talk about lifestyle changes, we don't mean limiting the amount of water that you're drinking just to, make, to be as dry as possible and produce as little urine as possible, but lifestyle changes like eating healthy, exercising, having a much better um, health, you know, life health balance as opposed to drinking a pot of coffee every morning and creating the issues. Um, we typically begin in the pathway of treating these issues with medication. There are two general classes of medication, which can be helpful in overactive bladder. We'll address those a little bit later. And then beyond that, there are the more advanced therapies, and we'll touch upon all of that here shortly. As I said, lifestyle changes are simple. Diet, exercise, um, biofeedback, and Kegel exercises. Many women are very familiar with Kegel exercises after childbirth. Helps to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles and regain a little bit better control by strengthening the sphincter muscle and the urethra. 
at the base of the bladder. Biofeedback also focuses on this in allowing patients to actually see and participate in that strengthening and exercising of the pelvic floor. That is typically done through one of our physical therapists here in town. Oral medications, the classic medications that we have used um, go by many different names, oxybutynin, ditropan, Vesicare, um, Toviaz, and they have a lot of side effects, unfortunately. They can cause dry mouth, they can cause constipation, they can cause some blurry vision, high blood pressure, and there are some more recent studies which suggest they may increase the risk for dementia in the elderly population. So we have kind of started to very slowly move away from this class of medications. The biggest problem because of this array of side effects and how frequently they occur, the dropout rate in the first six months with patients who try these medications, even if they are getting results and having improvement in their overactive symptoms, can be upwards of 70% who drop out simply because they don't like the side effects. The other kind of more advanced therapy that we use and have used for many years is the use of Botox. Everyone knows that we use Botox to prevent wrinkles. We use Botox for migraine headaches. Um, it's used for a multitude of other reasons in the body, but we have found that the injection of Botox, which is a muscle paralyzing agent into the muscular wall of the bladder can kind of stun or calm the bladder down and reduce the overactive symptoms. It comes at a price, unfortunately. Botox has a six to 16% chance for causing urinary retention where you go from having overactive symptoms, have your injection, and then suddenly you won't be able to empty the bladder at all, which can lead to intermittent catheterization, the need to put a catheter in the bladder to drain the urine out several times a day until the effects of the Botox wear off. And that's the other issue with the Botox is it is something that does not last and has to be done repeatedly. And so Botox injections can be done anywhere from every four to 12 months on average. And it requires a lot of back and forth to the office, to the ambulatory surgery center, to the hospital, wherever the injections are done. And as you can see here at the bottom of the page, about half of the patients get worn out with this idea. And after two injections, we have a 50% dropout rate. So that's not ideal as well. So when we talk about the advanced therapies, we talk about bladder control, we talk about bowel control, and it really all falls into the same conversation because we're talking about how we address the same nerve for each of those issues. The first way uh, of doing any sort of nerve stimulation to control overactive bladder is tibial nerve stimulation. As you can see on the screen, we can take a needle that's basically an acupuncture needle uh, down by your ankle bone on the inside of your foot. And there is a nerve that's right there called the tibial nerve. And that nerve runs up the back of the leg, goes into the pelvis and basically becomes the bladder nerve. And so in a very painless fashion, once a week for a 12 week run in my office, patients come in, have a seat, read a book, put their foot up on a pedestal, and we can stimulate that nerve for 30 minutes. And again, it's not a painful stimulation, but it's, it's enough to retrain the bladder to behave in a better fashion and in a more normal fashion. The biggest issue that I talk to patients about, number one, is we're trying to tell your bladder what to do from three feet down your leg. And so there can be some signal loss there, and that can be an issue. And the other issue is when this does work, we do it for 12 weeks and, and patients have tremendous success. What happens when we stop doing it on a weekly basis? And some patients slowly slide back to where they began with their symptoms. Some patients do great and never require additional treatment. So it's a little bit uh, all across the board as far as success with this therapy, but it's something that we do quite a bit of here in the office and have seen patients who are very satisfied with the results. Sacral stimulation is just a, a different way to stimulate the same nerve. And we have found that with a more direct stimulation of the bladder nerve at the level of the sacrum or your tailbone, um, we can gently but steadily retrain that bladder nerve. The, the beauty of this therapy is that we now are able to do a test here in the office. And it's kind of a, 
a try it before you buy it mentality and that we can do the simple test um, in the office setting, which is, rel which, which is easy to do. It's comfortable. It takes all of about 15 minutes. And over the course of three to five days, while we are constantly doing the stimulation by placing the stimulator in next to the bladder nerve itself, rather than three feet down the leg, we can get a very quick idea of just how much better the bladder will behave with this stimulation. And it helps us to identify patients who are gonna do well with a more permanent implant and can look forward to their future again. So as I said, try it before you buy it. That's the beauty. The way the test is done is our patients come in and lay down on the table on their stomachs for about 15 minutes. And I go right down over the tailbone and inject a little Novocaine to numb up the skin. That is the worst part of the procedure is that does sting to numb up the skin. But then I can take that same fine needle and go through that numb area of the skin and, and dance that needle around until I find the bladder nerve and then directly stimulate the bladder nerve. And what happens when we stimulate the bladder nerve directly, it creates a pelvic floor muscle contraction. So as we're doing the stimulation, we're asking patients, what do you feel and where do you feel it? And if, if they feel that stimulation down in the pelvis, like a small muscle contraction. So it's almost like a, tap, a pulsing or a, a tapping sensation. We know we're on the correct nerve. We can leave a little electrical lead next to that nerve, tape it down to the skin. And for three days and nights, we constantly stimulate the bladder and we find out just how much difference there is as far as bladder control or bowel control. So who's good candidate for this? Um, basically, Anyone who has overactive bladder symptoms, including the urgency, the frequency, the urge incontinence, the fecal incontinence, and those people who have retention that is not due to some degree of mechanical obstruction. If you tried medications, they didn't work, they had terrible side effects, couldn't afford them, whatever the reason may be, you've tried lifestyle changes, tried to be healthier, tried to exercise, decreased caffeine in your diet and still having the overactive issues, then it's time to move on to these therapies. So is it safe? What are the side effects? Everyone asks and, and should ask. Um, it is a very safe and effective treatment. Um, as far as satisfaction, up to 85% of the people who have a stimulator are satisfied with the results. Um, that's three times better than the results if you critically look at the outcome studies with medications. Um, on the right, 76% of people achieve success versus 49% with medications. Again, these are studies, large, large numbers of patients that reinforce how much more successful this therapy can be when patients have failed some of the simple medications and earlier therapies. So, how does this affect your life? Well, it, it, it gives you confidence to be out of the house, not knowing where every bathroom is around town, not feeling that you have to rush, not having to wear a pad or a liner uh, and be disruptive to any activities you'd like to participate in. So what it boils down to is what happens when you come to our office? Um, we like to get started, whether it's overactive bladder or retention, um, or fecal incontinence, um, we have an initial visit um, and we kind of discuss and make sure that we're talking about the proper diagnosis. And that can be a visit um, with me, that can be a visit with my physician's assistant, and I want to introduce Cara Bresson right now. Come on in, Cara. Um, Cara is a, a face and a voice that you'll see a lot of um, if we start to go down this pathway. Cara has a lot of experience uh, and works with me hand in hand as far as patient care, uh, being a participant in the care pathway and kind of tailoring individual patient needs to the proper treatment and ultimately ending up with not only the right diagnosis, but the right treatment. And so, um, Again, I wanna say thank you for being with us tonight. We appreciate and, and uh, respect how valuable your time is. So thanks for being with us. Um, we are happy to stay here and answer questions as long as you like. And um, we really look forward to um, meeting you in person, come into the office, call and make an appointment and uh, let's start addressing the issue. Thank you.
So Dr. Walsh, I do have a few questions here. Um, the first one is, is the procedure covered by Medicare? Um, the question is uh, Medicare and coverage for the procedure. Yes, it is covered by Medicare. Um, most every insurer from a private insurance standpoint covers the procedure as well. Uh, it is not covered by Medicaid, unfortunately, but we're, uh, we're hopeful that that's going to change. That's the next question. So we have another question and it is pertaining to a gentleman that had a prostate check and he has no problems. He's a 73 year old male in good shape and he could set his clock by when he has to rise at sleep to urinate typically every one and a half hours until he has to get up. He doesn't have the problem during the day and while or while he's awake. Some nights he gets up four or five times and no urgency, but wakes him up every night on cue. Um, so he has had some testing, but he opted to not have more invasive bladder inspection just because he didn't think that after all the other testing, he needed it. So what is your take on this and what should he do? Well, I would say that in, in most men over the age of 50, um, we usually start by assuming that there is some sort of prostate involvement to any trouble emptying the bladder, getting up more often at night. That is the classic starting point with men is to evaluate the prostate, see if there's any obstruction. Um, a digital rectal exam does not really tell us nearly enough information as far as whether the prostate is causing obstruction. We work through those issues, and then if we find that there's no obstruction within the prostate, then we move on to the overactive category, and we start talking about medications and, and moving on down that care pathway. Awesome. So another one is, I travel for work and cannot be available on the same day each week for 12 weeks. How flexible is that schedule? It's very flexible. There is there is nothing magical, magical about every seventh day as far as stimulation and treatment. So we work around patient schedules all the time, and we, we, we try to find a schedule that will work as regularly as possible, but we are certainly very flexible. Is this procedure covered by Medicare? Yeah, we just addressed that. Uh, Medicare does um, recognize this as a uh, viable treatment, uh, and there's no issues as far as coverage. Do you treat IBS-C? I do not. That is that is uh, irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. That is something that the gastroenterologists treat, and so that's something that you want to seek out uh, a referral to a gastroenterologist. Do you have to wear the stimulator constantly? Um, during the testing phase for those three to five days, um, you will have a kind of a remote control for the stimulator. It looks like a cell phone. And that's something that has to be within a hundred feet of you. So when you're at home, it sits on the counter in the kitchen. Uh, it travels with you to the bed stand at night, um, but it does not have to be worn all the time. Once we move forward with the permanent implant, Everything is buried under the skin. There's nothing that you have to carry. And the only reason you would use the remote controller that you will have is to turn the device on or off if you went through uh, a TSA checkpoint or if you wanted to make an adjustment to the device as far as changing the settings. Can you use this if you have a Medtronic loop recorder? Yes, you can. Uh, there's absolutely no contraindication between the two. Do I have to wear the stimulator constantly? Again, once we implant, uh, do the permanent implant, everything is buried in the body uh, through a very small two-inch incision back in the buttocks. It's a, it's a burial of the, of the battery or the uh, generator which runs the system, and that is buried deep enough that it, you can't see it. It's not unsightly in any way, um, and again, it's through a very small incision. 
Can OAB symptoms be similar to interstitial cystitis? Absolutely. Uh, there's tremendous crossover between those diagnoses. Um, many of, of interstitial cystitis patients will have the overactive bladder symptoms such as frequency and urgency and pressure in the bladder. And so that again goes back to coming up with the proper diagnosis to get started. First, you have to know what you're dealing with and then we know how to address it properly. Um, how long before I see improvement after the interstim? Uh, with the test that we do, um, typically three to five days, you should see right out of the gate, you should see some improvement. And over the course of those three to five days, there should be enough of a change and improvement in your symptoms that it should be quite clear that this therapy is successful and we want to talk about moving forward with implantation. Is the anesthesia for, for procedure for the permanent implant? Uh, there is light anesthesia. Uh, it's almost like sedation during a colonoscopy. So uh, it's twilight sleep. Okay, I have another one here that wants to know, uh, will this help if your problem is when you cough? No, this is not indicated for stress incontinence. Uh, the coughing, sneezing, lifting heavy objects, that is a completely different type of incontinence and it's treated with completely different therapies. Um, do, do bladder pops affect an overactive bladder? I'm not quite sure what that question is getting at, um, but um, overactive bladder uh, and um, most of the behavioral lifestyle uh, of things that affect it are going to be diet related or um, poor health. What is the downside of permanent implant, like the maintenance? There really is no maintenance. Once we implant the device, it's hands-free. The only time that there's any hands-on is we have two different battery types that we can implant. We have a what I call a hands-free battery that has an average lifespan of five years where it doesn't need any attention. Or we have a smaller battery that we can implant that is rechargeable and can last up to 15 years. With that rechargeable year, a uh, rechargeable battery, um, typically every one to two weeks, there's a, a recharging belt that has to be worn that will recharge the battery over the course of an hour or two. Um, if I start the stimulator process now and then relocate to Florida in the future, do they have doctors that do this there? Yes, we have implanters all across the country and we can always help you find a new implanter um, wherever you relocate to. Um, so this actually helps for both urinary and bowel control, correct? That's correct. Both urge incontinence and overactive bladder as well as fecal incontinence and control issues as far as um, losing and having fecal accidents. Which I think just answered my next question that I have here, which is, is the Medtronic implant effective with infrequent fecal incontinence? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> oh, I think that question that we didn't understand earlier, do bladder polyps affect an overactive bladder? Uh, um, bladder polyps, if they're benign and non-cancerous, will not affect um, overactive bladder in any way and certainly would not get in the way uh, with doing any sort of nerve stimulation. Um, but obviously part of the evaluation can include uh, cystoscopy where we take a small camera and very quickly look in the bladder because on rare occasions there can be bladder cancers that can cause or stimulate overactive bladder symptoms. And so that is part of the whole evaluation for each patient. Is it possible to have urinary retention, stress incontinence, and overactive bladder all at once, or is it only one or the other? No, they can all lead to the same problem. Um, and typically in those situations, people will actually hold on to a large volume of urine and they will basically have what we call overflow incontinence. So the bladder is full most of the time. And when it's pressurized or stressed with a cough or a sneeze, you will have some leakage, which is the stress component, as well as the bladder being irritable because it's full all the time, which can lead to the frequency and urgency sensations. Um, so is there any 
problems with the battery? And again, is that also MRI compatible? Yeah, we're, we're very pleased as of um, 2000, uh, the FDA approved all MRI friendly and compatible, uh, both batteries and the leads that are in by the nerve. And so there is no contraindication for MRI anymore. And that was a, a tremendous step forward uh, with this device. So this might, it goes hand in hand with that one, but how long does the device last once it's implanted and how often does it have to be replaced? The, the lead, once it's implanted, typically is in permanently. It can be removed if, if necessary for some reason, but the battery itself tends to last on average for five years if we go with a non-rechargeable battery or 10 to 15 years if we go with the rechargeable unit. So this one is, I eat healthy and keep active. I have had physical therapy. It didn't help. I don't want medications. Can I skip to the stimulation? Um, we certainly can begin the evaluation uh, depending on the insurers. Many of the insurance companies require a, at least a brief trial of medication um, to prove that either the patient cannot tolerate it due to side effects or um, does not have a, a positive result. So typically we have to take that intermediate step, even if it's brief. It looks like I just have one more question here. And what is the recovery like and how does this change um, our lives once we have it installed? The recovery is, is very simple because it's such a small incision. Um, there really is no restrictions following surgery and implantation other than um, we don't want you submerged underwater in a bathtub or a hot tub uh, or in a swimming pool for the first two weeks, just to allow that small incision to heal. And we ask not a lot of lifting and bending over during the first week, but patients are out the door as an outpatient surgery and back to doing pretty much anything they choose right away. So Velma, if that's the last question, Unless we have more, we are good. I, again, thank everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we look forward to meeting you and uh, beginning this journey uh, towards getting better control over the bladder and the bowels. Thanks so much for joining us. Okay. How are you feeling? You guys look great. Thank you. I, I, I like the little neckerchief and not a good handkerchief. Oh, yeah. It adds a little bit. You look great, Cara. Thank you.